What if I told you that the best way to make something original is to imitate other writers? I call this theory imitate than innovate. And it's built on the idea that in general, creators spend much less time imitating their heroes than they do trying to make something new, something original. And I'll tell you why, but I don't think this is a good thing. And I actually call it the originality disease, which I define as a pervasive plague that makes creators feel scared to imitate other people's styles. And the problem is worst amongst writers who speak about their craft with levels of mystery that are usually reserved for the numinous and the transcendent. But writers would be smart to learn from creators in other fields. So let's start talking about cinema. Hollywood film directors are often seen as the essence of what creative excellence looks like. When people look at, I don't know, a director like Quentin Tarantino or something, they see this, this mad creative with a singular talent for making original movies, right? But Tarantino's originality, his distinct style, it begins with imitation. Let me explain. He's famous for replicating and then building upon scenes from other movies. And he once even said, I steal from every single movie ever made. And looking at Tarantino's work, I revel in this paradox that imitation and innovation are not opposed, but can actually operate in tandem. So let's take a step back. What are some of the causes of this originality disease that you should make sure to avoid in your writing? The first issue is that people misunderstand inspiration. They forget that some of the juiciest inspiration comes from admiring and maybe even reverse engineering other people's work. But many writers think that inspiration needs to go boom, strike out of thin air, like a bolt of lightning or something. And so they fear that the muses of novelty won't even visit them if their mind has been contaminated with work and writing that's been done before. And so in pursuit of originality, they avoid studying anything that's come before them out of that fear of tainting their minds with the stain of influence. And then the second issue is more subtle. People pursue useless forms of originality. And I think this part of the originality disease comes from academia, where people do study those who've come before them, and that's good. But the problem is that they only become familiar with other people's work so that they can eventually do something different. And incentives are to blame here because scholarly journals insist on original contributions. And so academics are incentivized to study things that nobody else is studying. The challenge though, is that originality and usefulness, they're not the same thing. And I worry that academics and students who go through the school system are so focused on checking that nobody's ever written about this before box that they sometimes forget to make useful contributions to human knowledge. And then, the third issue, I'm not gonna lie, it's pure conjecture, but it's fun. And the issue is self-obsession. You know, maybe our originality disease has its roots in Freud's work, which more than a century after its release still underpins our models of human psychology. And to the extent that ideas like the ego and the subconscious, to the extent that they seem trivial, it's only because those ideas have been so influential. Everybody knows about them. Everybody uses those words when they talk about the mind. And Freud's ideas basically went viral in the early 20th century. And as they did, they made their way to artists like Salvador Dali, who led Europe's surrealist painting movement. And instead of trying to capture reality like the realists or interpret reality like the impressionists, the surrealists like Dali, they went inwards and they painted the landscape of their own consciousness. They rejected logic and reason and instead, they favored these dream-inspired visions. And the point there is that just like writers with the originality disease, the Surrealists rejected the outer world and just looked within for inspiration. Okay, let's pause here. I've laid out the problem, but now it's time for answers. What is the solution, the alternative to the originality disease? I say that it's a pursuit towards truth. In the words of C.S. Lewis, who was famous for the vivid imagination that he presented in stories like the Chronicles of Narnia and in nonfiction books about Christianity and human nature, he said that no man who cares about originality will ever be original. It's the man who's only thinking about doing a good job or telling the truth who really becomes original. And here's the key point, and doesn't notice it. Lewis's words align with the premise of 
an excellent documentary called Why Beauty Matters by Roger Scruton. And Scruton opens it with the idea that before the 20th century, if you asked anybody about the purpose of creating art, they would have said, to make something beautiful. But beginning around the time of Duchamp's urinal in 1917, where he takes a literal urinal and puts it in an art museum, what happens after that is that the primary purpose of art shifted from shocking its viewer with originality instead of creating beauty. And this brings us to the core idea of this video, that to write something original, not for the sake of originality, but for the sake of pursuing truth and wonder and beauty, you gotta copy other writers. You gotta imitate them. You know, Hunter S. Thompson once hand wrote every word of The Great Gatsby so he could feel what it's like to write a great novel. Robert Louis Stevenson meticulously copied paragraphs that he enjoyed, and once he got familiar with them, he threw the books to the other side of the room to force himself to rewrite paragraphs from memory. And as these writers were imitating their heroes, they were internalizing what made them great. And out of excessive trepidation, we've lost touch with the subtle but important distinction between stealing other people's work without giving them credit, which is obviously a bad thing, and mirroring the style or values of a writer that you admire, which should be praised and promoted. And through teaching writing, I've discovered that the surest sign of an amateur writer is somebody who values originality as their ultimate goal, when they should really value quality, beauty, or clear communication instead. And for a video about how Pablo Picasso himself was a notorious imitator, click here.